A G Man Comes to Town by Warder Edwards. Originally published in The Thriller Library, number 211, volume 8, February 18, 1933. He wanted to talk about Nick Shank to Mr. X, the smartest undercover man Scotland Yard has ever known. Dead men don't talk, said Shank, and acted accordingly, but Mr. X got on his trail all the same and stayed there. A Gripping Long Complete Story of Mr. X Chapter 1 The Black Shadow Oskar claimed to be the scion of an ancient Swedish family, but the fact remains that he was part Armenian, part Polish Jew, part Chinese, and he had inherited all the less savoury qualities of the three races. That Oskar was an astute man can be accepted without quibble, for he was supreme boss of the Rand Diamond Corporation, the all-powerful combine that controls the diamond markets of the world. A millionaire at thirty, he had forged ruthlessly ahead, smashing down opposition, walking over the face of the underdog, amassing wealth and a multitude of enemies, for he was cold-blooded and brutal in all his dealings. The Rand Corporation had held a conference in London, and all the most expensive suites in the most exclusive luxury hotels had been taken over by the diamond magnates and their families. The magnates themselves seemed to ooze opulence from the pores of their swarthy skins. Their womenfolk dazzled the eye with a day and night parade of precious stones. On the evening of the last day of the conference, Oscar Gar was seated in a shabby office in Hatton Garden, the unpretentious street that is the hub of the diamond trade. The cheap American desk at which he sat was tea-stained and shabby, and that went for the carpet, the old-fashioned horsehair furniture, and the gilt and red wallpaper, but there was nothing shabby about Oscar himself. Short, stout, broad-shouldered, with smooth, lemon-hued skin and oily, jet-black hair brushed straight back from a wide forehead, his taste in clothes reflected the sartorial fashions of Buenos Aires. His perfectly cut suit was of a fine mauve cloth, his silk tie a darker shade of mauve, his shirt, collar, and underwear of heavy silk. A diamond of fabulous size scintillated in his tie. His short, fat, manicured fingers were adorned by many rings. The face was round and plump, but not puffy, the eyes small and black like restless spots of quicksilver. Oscar was feeling pleased with things, as he helped himself to a Cuban cigar from a heavy gold case, and lit up from the flame of a gold diamond-studded lighter. The poor suckers, he chuckled, shaking in the armchair, like robbing a kid of its candy. For in the last session of the conference, he had bluffed and bullied his co-directors into increasing his emolument by fifty thousand dollars a year. A timorous knock came at the door. Come he called, his voice surprisingly thin for a man of his solid build. A nervous, pasty-faced little man took an apologetic step into the office. There was awe in his faded eyes as he looked at the prosperous, well-fed man at the desk. A gentleman wishes to see you, sir, he announced breathlessly. What's his name? Oh, for the love of Pete, cried a voice from the corridor and the next moment the feeble clerk was flung violently aside and the caller strode into the room. I thought I'd look in, old-timer, he drawled, bearing down upon Oscar Gar with outstretched hand. Gee, I'm glad to see you again. This is swell, said Gar, wringing the other's hand. Then, as the clerk shot a scared look over his shoulder and scuttled out of the office, closing the door softly behind him. So it's you, Shank! he snarled, his thick lips curling back from diamond-filled teeth. What do you want with me, you slimy, blood-sucking sub-aportsate fairy? What do I want? echoed the visitor, his voice quiet, his expression vacant as usual. Let me see, Oscar. Ah, I've got it. It'd be dough, I guess. Lots of dough, Oscar. You ain't getting another dime out of me, grated Gar with an obscene Dago oath. I'm through. You'll be through if you don't listen to reason, said Nick Schenk meaningly, clean through and out the other side. Oscar Gar shot a look of dark hatred at him. What do you mean? he demanded. You know what I mean, brother, drawled Nick Schenk. Don't act dumb. I'm being blacked again, am I? 
Nick Shank looked shocked for a fleeting moment. Then his round face became vacant once more. Call it what you like, he drawled, talking round a fat cigar. But I prefer to call it business. You're going to pay me protection money, Oscar. Protection money, snarled Gar, his thin voice shaking with fury. I don't want protection. I can take care of myself. He jumped to his feet, his bright eyes ugly, his face light green in color. Get the hell out of here, Shank, before I... Aw, oh, nuts. Nick Shank spat on the carpet and lowered himself into a prickly horsehair armchair. Deliberately, he removed his Stetson and tossed it onto the desk. He sat back, crossed his legs, made himself at home. You are going to cough up protection money, Oscar, pursued the boss of the crime syndicate, and you're going to like it, and it won't be chicken feed this time. The syndicate's out for real dough in a fast clean-up. Oscar Gar glowered hard at the round, vacuous countenance. Say, how do you aim to turn the heat on me? he demanded. That's going to be easy, Oscar, drawled Schenk, pulling hard at his cigar and talking through a thick haze of blue smoke. I can still prove that you made your first pile of jack in the IDB rackets. And now, he went on, I can prove something else. Something that'll knock the props out from under you and blow your social ambitions sky high. Go on, nodded Gar, showing his glittering teeth in a leer. I'll call your bluff. What else can you prove? What I can prove concerns a pretty cape girl. She was called Mirandi and had the body of a golden-skinned young Venus. She was the Belle of Scarsburg, the native village a few miles outside Modestine, where you were living at that time. Remember, Oscar. One day she disappeared, and the rumor went round that she'd been kidnapped. She was found some days later, and she was dead. Nick Shank swayed forward in his chair and gazed fissedly into the wet, yellowish face of the diamond magnate. I know how, why, and when she died, Oscar, he said, his voice low, toneless. I can bring proof, Penny and Happeny. The two Cape boys who looked after your house saw everything. You strangled Mirandi because she wouldn't have anything to do with you, and then tossed her body into the river. You can't prove a darn thing, shouted Gar. Who's going to believe the word of a couple of Cape boys? Nick Shank regarded the other with a sardonic, half-pitying smile. Don't kid yourself about that, Oscar, he drawled. Those two smokes will be believed all right. Your name still stinks around Kimberley and the mines districts. Anyway, he went on impatiently, a guy with your dough, a guy who aimed to horn into high hat society, wouldn't stand for the scandal. He reached for his hat, half rose from his chair. Get down to brass tacks, Pronto, he rapped out, or I'm beating it. Oh, hold your horses, fella, cried Gar, his beady eyes bright with fright and venom. You've got me where you want me, I guess. What's this phony protection probe you're trying to stick on me? The boss of the crime syndicate tossed his cigar butt into the fireplace, gnawed off the end of another weed, carefully lit up from an ornate silver lighter. I'll tell you, he said. You're going to need a lot of protection when you throw that swell party next week. Like lots of other saps, you think gangsters only operate in New York, Chicago, and the other big cities in the States. So let me tell you, there's a swift, jewel-snatching mob in London right now. What's more... I've been tipped off that they aim to pull a clean-up at your swell party. Oscar Gar stared at his visitor aghast. Say, is this on the level? He breathed, badly rattled for once in his life. Yeah, nodded Nick Schenk soberly. It's on the level, Oscar. I ain't feeding you the bunk. Hell, don't it stand to reason that something's liable to bust loose with all those rocks lying around? Listen, Sap. Every game at the party will be loaded down with ice, from head to instep. I'll bet a million quid wouldn't buy all the sparklers that'll be on parade at the party. That's where my protection idea comes in, Oscar. Yeah, I get you, nodded Gar. I guess you're talking turkey. What's your proposition? he urged eagerly. Oscar, old-timer, drawled the big shot, chewing hard on his cigar. Come across with the right kind of dough, and I'll see to it that your party goes off as smooth as molasses. 
My boys will take care of this London mob if they try to pull a fast one. Leave it all to me, brother. Is it a deal? I'll say it is, Nick, nodded Oscar Gar. Let's go into a huddle. Chapter 2 The Man Who Vanished The mantle of dusk was settling upon the embankment when the pearl-grey car swept through the gates of Scotland Yard and drew up before the stolid grey stone building that is the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police Force. The smart vehicle had powerful headlamps burning, but the interior light had not been switched on. A fresh-faced young constable stepped forward and fixed the driver with an interrogative eye. Yes, he prompted. The two gents inside, answered the driver, jerking a nod over his shoulder. Want to see Mr. X? Is that all? asked the constable, a shade of sarcasm in his tone, for Mr. X, ace undercover man at the yard, was perhaps the most elusive and inaccessible man in London. That's all, nodded the driver, nettled. There, there. But the young constable was not listening. Hearing the scratch of a match and a quiet cough, he had looked round to quiz the newcomer, and no sooner did he recognise the smooth-faced, mild-eyed gentleman who was lighting a cigarette than he came to attention and gave a respectful salute. Then, interpreting a glance from the mild blue eyes, he turned about and swung open the door of the car. The next thing he did was to slant a suspicious glance at the driver. How many passengers do you say you're carrying? he inquired in a flat voice. Two, frowned the driver. Didn't little cloth ears hear me first time? I heard you first time, returned the constable, and thrust head and shoulders into the gloom of the car. You've only got one passenger now, he called a moment later, and he's fast asleep. Oh, nuts, scoffed the driver, switching on the interior light and then he gasped and stiffened in his seat, staring through the glass partition, staring wide-eyed at the huddled figure in a corner seat. The fair, dressed in a blue suit and dark overcoat, had a felt hat tilted over his eyes, and the hands, clasped tightly upon his lap, were lean but shapely, sensitive hands with long, tapering fingers. The chin, smooth and round, sagged upon a black-knitted tie. Of a second passenger there was no sign. Cork perishing Lino, breathed the driver, still staring like a man hypnotized. Can you beat that for a vanishing trick? I'll swear me affidavit. One moment, Ryland. It was the mild-eyed man in evening kit who eased the constable aside and ducked into the car, a quiet air of authority about him as he took charge of the situation. He did not attempt to rouse the slumped figure in the corner, but carefully lifted the rim of the felt hat and studied the grey face of the fair, then placing an arm about the latter's chest. He slowly eased the body forward until the bright light of the overhead lamp gleamed upon the white bone handle of a Mexican dagger. The blade of the knife was thrust well into the back of the neck, a shade off centre. The mild blue eyes of the man in evening kit were not so mild as he replaced the body in its original position, and when he spoke there was an edge to his mellow voice, a tightening of the thin-lipped mouth. Get help, Ryland, he ordered crisply, and take the poor fellow up to Dr. Creedon's room. Yes, sir. Ducking out of the car, the man in dress clothes lit another cigarette, a brooding expression in his clear eyes, his pale face a marble mask, cold and inscrutable. Put the light out, he said shooting a swift, penetrating glance at the driver and looking away. The next moment the car was in darkness. Fine old how do you do, sir, ventured the driver, beginning to fidget. There's thousands of taxes and cars for ire in London, yet they must pick on my barrel to do their ruddy murder in. Why pick on me, sir? Can you beat that? Too bad, sympathized his companion, regarding him with calm but penetrating gaze. Then thoughtfully, Perhaps, he suggested, you don't like getting mixed up in murder jobs. The driver stiffened perceptibly, stared hard at the impassive face of the stranger, and gradually turned the colour of lead. The stranger, who was taking a cigarette from a slim gold case, did not appear to notice his companion's guilty reaction to his innocent question. You bet! I don't want to get mixed up in murder jobs, said the driver, looking moist and uneasy. This barrel's a car, not a funeral hearse. How long have you had her? asked the stranger. 
The driver, shifting uneasily in his seat, stared at the questioner with a puzzled, suspicious, half-frightened frown. How long have I dare? he echoed, pushing his cap back and ruffling his rusty fringe. Must be three years last February, if I remember right. It should be easy enough to remember, observed the other, lighting his cigarette. Wasn't Maury Morris bumped off by the Frankie Schaff mob in the following March? The killers used a pearl-grey delagion for the job, he went on, gazing towards the south side of the river, driven by a small-time crook called Shifty Griffin. Grey to the lips, perspiration pouring down his flat features, the driver stared at the speaker as though hypnotised, stark terror in his narrow eyes. For God's sake, sir, he husked, the shag cigarette slipping through his nervous fingers. I swear I didn't know it was a murder job that... I know you didn't know, cut in the other. Also, I know that you've got a nice little wife and a flock of kids to feed. The boys played you for a sucker. That's why you didn't find yourself at the old Bailey with Frankie and the other rats. But get an earful of this shifty. There's still time to pin an accessory badge on your chest, and that'll mean ten years on the moor for you. I'll see to that. The man in dress clothes stepped up to the grey-faced driver and looked deep into his narrow eyes. Get a load of this, Shifty, he ordered tonelessly. You are going to keep your big trap shut about what you've seen this evening. You didn't find a stiff in your car. Your mind's a blank. Breathe a word and you get yourself tossed into the can. We're keeping the murder dark, see? I yes, sir, nodded the driver, fearful and trembling. He stared at the poker-faced stranger as though he were a frightening, omniscient apparition. For God's sake, sir, he quavered, who are you? Just another copper, shifty, just another cop, came the grimly smiling reply. Detective Inspector Knapp, CID. Mr. X? The driver spoke in a husky, awed whisper, for the name of the ace undercover man was known and feared throughout the dives and rat runs of London's underworld. Mr. X? In person, my dear Shifty. Chapter 3. The Decoy This, Shifty, observed Mr. X in his smooth way, is your story in a nutshell. At approximately half-past six this evening, two gentlemen called at your garage in Hampstead to hire a car. The choice made, you were instructed to drive to Scotland Yard. Shifty, who was sitting upon the extreme edge of a leather armchair, nodded his rusty head. He looked shifty-eyed and uneasy. The atmosphere of New Scotland Yard did not appear to agree with him. Mr. X went on, his calm gaze never leaving the unintelligent face of his visitor. Traffic being heavy at that hour of the evening, there were a number of jams, and on three occasions at least you were held up for a minute or so, ample time, that is, for one or both of your passengers to have slipped out of the car and made off. Indeed, according to your story, one did actually vanish between Hampstead and Scotland Yard. That's God's truth, Mr. X, nodded Shifty, eager and earnest. Of course it is, smiled Xavier Knapp. I have the greatest trust in your veracity. You arrive here at about five minutes to seven with only one passenger, and he, poor devil, is in a bad state of health. Now then, Shifty, about the passenger who vanished en route. Yes, sir. Shifty sat forward in his seat. Did you get a good look at him in the garage, when they were choosing a car? Yes, sir. Shifty gave a vigorous nod of his rusty head. I'd know him again anywhere, sir. He was about five foot in height, a reglar swell, grey suit, grey topped boots, and grey trilby at, and he smelt like a lily. Snappy dresser, was Xavier Knapp's dry comment. Go on. His face was round like a baby's, with a pinky complexion, and he'd big grey eyes. His air was crinkly and yellow, and he spoke kind of pansified. You couldn't mistake him, Mr. X. I'll say not, agreed the undercover man. Thanks, Shifty. I think that will be all now, but we must keep in touch, of course. What's your address? The crook hesitated, as is the way of crooks when dealing with the police. Oh, never mind, said Mr. X, shrugging. Then a shade of relief passed across Shifty's flat features. You're not thinking of leaving 14 Canal Street, Stepney, are you? he asked, childlike innocence in his blue eyes. 
shifty flush to the roots of his unshorn hair. Er, uh, no, Mr. X, he mumbled, snatching his greasy cap off the carpet and getting up. No, sir. Show this gentleman out, Sergeant, ordered Xavier Knapp, a twinkle in his eye. Scarcely did the door close behind Shifty than Dr. Creedon slouched into the room. Loose-limbed, lanky, and sleepy-eyed, he lowered himself into the armchair, recently vacated by Shifty Griffin. Death instantaneous, he announced, in his staccato manner of speech. He leaned forward, helped himself to a Turkish cigarette, didn't live long enough to make a cry. Nice work on the part of the killer, observed Mr. X, a connoisseur of such things. It takes nerve to pull a murder in daylight, and in the West End at that. Even now I can't see how he got away with it. How about the frisk? Creedon shook his long, narrow head. Nothing doing, he answered. Cleaned out. No papers. No anything. Taylor's tabs. Wash out. It is all ready-made American store stuff. I guess as much. Dr. Creedon regarded the undercover man with a shrewd, sleepy eye. You know the corpse. His mouth tight, his blue eyes no longer mild. Mr. X gave a slow nod of his smooth, shapely head. Yes, I know him, Doc, he answered, but without a trace of emotion. I recognized him at once, although he was sandy-haired and wore a clipped ginger moustache when I last saw him in the States. Now, as you know, he's clean-shaven, black-haired and dark-skinned, and the gold-rimmed glasses are part of a clever disguise. But you saw through it, X. There was admiration in the doctor's lazy drawl. Who is the corpse? Captain Jago of the Chicago police, attached to the G-men. He was no Hercules to look at, but liquid dynamite when he went into action. The Chicago mobs have had him on the spot, ever since he staged a purity drive to clean up the city. In the end, he put the big shops out of business. Has that got anything to do with this kill, X? How should I know? shrugged the undercover man. But it certainly looks that way. However, I promise to find out for you, Doc. Seeing that Jago was about to call on me, I feel that it's up to me to hunt down the unspeakable rat who killed him in cold blood and find out what it's all about. We are up against a big proposition, Doc, he went on, reaching for another cigarette. Jago wouldn't have come from the States, a disguise at that, unless there was something really important about to break loose. It was to be a secret visit but he was croaked on the very doorstep of Scotland Yard, which means a whole lot. You've got a description of the murderer. I certainly have, Doc, nodded Mr. X. That rat knows all the answers, and I'm going to find him within twenty-four hours. There was a quiet certitude in the mellow voice, which caused Creedon to rouse himself from the depths of the armchair and regard the undercover man with eager eyes. You seem very sure of yourself, X, he said, trying to read the impassive countenance of Xavier Knapp. Is it going to be as easy as all that? It's going to be simplicity itself, returned Mr. X with his enigmatical smile. I'm going to stage a decoy act, Doc. Meaning? First of all, explained Mr. X, I must trace Jago, find out where he's been staying, and the fact that I can supply a detailed description of him should make this an easy matter. His Chicago accent will help, too. Next, knowing the name of his hotel, I shall disguise myself as Jago, which will be easy, Doc, both being of similar height and build, and take his place in the scheme of things, so to speak. Do you mean that you're going to try to pass yourself off as the murdered man? gasped Doc Creedon, sitting bolt upright in his armchair, shocked out of his lethargic state for once. Not only shall I try, came the quiet reply, but I shall get away with it. You can be perfectly sure, my dear Doc, that the murderer did not waste any time in making his escape from the car. It is doubtful whether he stayed long enough to assure himself that life was extinct. Nevertheless, added Mr. X, that he will be surprised to see me. That is my masterly impersonation of the late Captain Jago, I have no doubt. Surprised, Doc Creedon's homely face split into a wide grin. He'll have the scare of his life, X. You go to Jago's hotel and carry on as though you were Jago. How quick you are, my dear Doc. Mr. X smiled a little ironic smile. Yes, that is the idea. 
and I'm certain that it will force the killer and his friends to show their hand. His friends? echoed Doc Creedon. Do you think this is the work of a gang X? I'm sure about it, my dear Doc. I have a strong hunch that Captain Jago made his secret trip to London to warn me against a bunch of crooks known as the Crime Syndicate. The Crime Syndicate? Creedon gave a hopeless shake of his tawny head. That's a new one on me, X. As I told you just now, explained Xavier Knapp, Jago's clean-up put the big shots of Chicago out of business, with the result that the eight operators in all branches of crime got together and banded themselves into a combine. The syndicate numbers among its members the cream of Chai's forgers, pettermen, share pushers, con men, stick-up artists, blackmailers, jewel thieves, and so on. They operate independently, of course, but share the spoils. Everything goes into the common fund. They've worked most of the big cities in the States, and now, unless I miss my guess, they've descended upon London like a flock of vultures. Lord bless my soul, breathed Doc Creedon, dabbing his moist brow. It sounds fantastic. Incredible, X. It is neither, the undercover man assured him shortly. Jago got wind of the scheme, disguised himself, and came to London to warn me, fearing to trust either cable or wireless. He knew what he was up against, and he paid for the attempt with his life. Stout fellow. But the crime syndicate won't get away with it, Doc, he ran on, his blue eyes glinting like chips of ice. I'll smash the syndicate and hang J. Gold Killer or get croaked in the attempt. End of sample. Tune in next week for another exciting episode of Mr. X and the Crime Syndicate in A.G. Man Comes to Town.